Back in 1776, someone said, Give me coffee or give me death. And if that's how you feel, you should be at the Organic Man Coffee Train. They make coffee the right way, one delicious cup at a time. 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9. Coffee, the stuff dreams are made of. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Tonight is Halloween, if you're listening to this on Arcanasa.com. If you're listening to it on one of the other websites or you're in the archives, hope you enjoy the show. I understand it's supposed to be a full moon on the 31st. As far as I could find, all of these stories are true. There are those out there that will say, oh, that never happened. Well, there's a lot of people that just don't want to believe anything could possibly happen that might upset them in the least little bit way. Halloween night, 1957. Betty Fabiano heard the doorbell ring at her home in Sun Valley, California, just outside Los Angeles. It was well past 11 p.m. All the kids should be home eating too much candy and telling scary stories to each other. Figuring it was just some late-night trick-or-treater, her husband Peter got up and walked downstairs to answer the door. Isn't it kind of late for this sort of thing? Betty heard her husband ask. As she could hear someone respond, just a muffled voice. She said it sounded like a man impersonating a woman. There was a pop, followed by a thud. Shortly after, Betty heard the screech of tires as a car sped away. She headed downstairs to see what was taking Peter so long to come back to bed. Her husband was sprawled on the floor, unconscious, blood pouring from his chest. He died on the way to the hospital. The cause of death was a thirty-eight caliber bullet lodged just beneath his heart. No one could figure a motive for what newspapers dubbed the trick-or-treat murder. Fabiano, 35, who had served in the Marine Corps during World War II, had one brush with the law, a minor bookmaking charge in 1948. That would be placing an illegal bet on either a horse, race, or a game. Other than that, this one charge, his record was clean. Peter had been making a living running several prosperous Betty shop, Betty beauty shops in Los Angeles. He and Betty were well off and didn't seem to need anything in the way of money. As the authorities dug into the case, they discovered there had been some rough times in the Fabiano home. They had recently been in a bit of a dispute and had spent some time living apart. Betty had moved in with her close friend, Joanne Rebel, and their friendship had blossomed. A Peter didn't care for his wife's new friendship, He had known Joanne for some time, and there were some hard feelings between them. Joanne Rebel was a divorced 40-year-old freelance photographer who had worked briefly in one of Fabiano's shops. She told police the Fabianos were two of her closest friends. When Betty had decided to return to her husband and try to make their lives work out once more, Peter had agreed, but he had one condition. He didn't want his wife to see Rebel, or to bring her to the house, or talk about her, or 
to see her ever again. Uh, those hard feelings must have been really hard. There was something between Betty and Joanne that Peter didn't much care for. Perhaps Peter blamed Joanne for coming between him and his wife. Maybe she did. Betty agreed to Peter's conditions, and soon they were once more living as a couple. <clears throat> the police questioned Betty about Joanne Rebell, and then they went to question this friend. Rebell said she had absolutely nothing to do with the shooting, and in fact, she hadn't left home that night. Her car had been sitting in the driveway where anybody could have seen it. <clears throat> Police continued looking into Rebel as a potential suspect. They asked her neighbors about whether or not they had seen her car in the driveway the night of the murder. Margaret Barrett said that on the night of the shooting, Joanne had borrowed her car after saying that hers wasn't running right. She believed that the odometer had shown about a 35-mile round trip. When confronted with the story of borrowing her friend's car, Joanne said that she'd forgotten as she had driven to the grocery store that night. She continued saying she had nothing to do with the murder. The distance driven was the distance between Joanne's home and the Fabiano home. As the questioning continued, Joanne kind of changed her story, saying she had not pulled the trigger. November 16th, they arrested Rebel on charges of murder, but then they were forced to release her since she refused to confess and they had no real proof of her even having been near the murder scene, let alone having shot Peter Fabiano. A lot of crimes are solved by somebody knowing something and then telling the police. Had the Unabomber been an only child, the FBI might still be looking for him. Someone knew something about the Fabiano murder, and they called the police. Authorities were told to look inside a department store rental locker. <clears throat> inside the locker, they found a thirty-eight caliber handgun. Ballistics confirmed that it was the murder weapon. Ballistics are unique to each weapon. The bullet is scored by the lands and grooves as it passes down the barrel. Even if the barrel was made on an assembly line, every one is slightly different. A scan of the sales records of the gun shops in the area led to the owner. Golden Pizer had bought the handgun just a short time ago. The receipt was in her name. Authorities looked into her history, but she didn't sound like a murderer. as She was known as being an introvert and somewhat self-conscious. She was a 40-year-old laboratory technician at Los Angeles Children's Hospital. When the police arrested her, she admitted to pulling the trigger immediately. <clears throat> Golden said she did it while under hypnotic control. She had no choice but to shoot Peter Fabiano. Golden said she was under a spell that had been cast on her by another woman. A woman that wanted Peter dead. This Svengali woman was Joanne Rebel. A Svengali was a 1931 supernatural drama horror film produced and distributed by Warner Brothers. The film starred John Barrymore and co-starred Maureen Marsh. The movie was based on a gothic horror novel, Trilby, written in 1894 by George Du Maurier. In the story, Svengali was able to control people by hypnosis and telepathy. He hypnotized women to do his bidding. The word Svengali has come to refer to a person who, with evil intent, dominates and manipulates and controls another person. 
In court, this Fengali defense is a legal tactic that presents the defendant as a pawn in the scheme of a greater and more influential criminal mastermind. It's not my fault. They made me do it, kind of thing. Police hauled Rebel back in. As she refused to answer their questions even after hearing Golden uh, telling how she had manipulated her into going to the Fabiano home and shooting Peter. The story unfolded as the police did some more digging. The two women had known each other for about three years. After Betty Fabiano had severed all ties with Rebel, Rebel turned her attention to Golden. Just about every day, Rebel's major topic of conversation had been Peter Fabiano. Golden Pizer told authorities that Rebel had said Peter Fabiano was evil and a vile man who was destroying everything around him. Pizer believed her friend and grew to hate Fabiano even though she had never even seen him. A Golden told the police Rebel said Peter mistreated his wife and that he was dealing in narcotics. She also told police Rebel had told her Peter Fabiano was always bothering her at home. He was stalking her. <clears throat> after a few months, Fabiano was all that they talked about. Hour after hour, Rebel would rail about her rival's evil nature and his cruelty to his wife and children. Within two months, Pizer was certain Fabiano was a monster and one had to be destroyed. Pizer said Joanne and her discussed killing Fabiano many times. She said in her confession they were undecided whether they should use poison, a knife, or a gun. They finally settled on a gun. With money that Rebel gave her, Pizer bought the revolver in Pasadena, giving the dealer the total plausible story that she needed it for home protection. She bought only two bullets. I didn't know you could buy just two bullets. I always buy them in a box or a case. Two bullets. Hmm. Halloween night. Rebel decided a time when a person running around the streets in a disguise would not raise an eyebrow, and this was the perfect time. Rebel took Pizer to Fabiano's beauty shop a few times in October. She would know what her target looked like. The night of the murder, Rebel showed up at Pizer's home in a borrowed car, the one she had borrowed from Margaret Barrett. A Pizer's costume, which Rebel had in a bag, was not very elaborate. A pair of jeans, a khaki jacket, a hat, red gloves, and a domino mask, like the one the Lone Ranger wore, and some dark face paint to disguise her features. They hid the gun in a paper bag. <clears throat> The two women drove to Fabiano's home, arriving about 9 p.m., and waited for two hours until the lights went out in the bedroom. A Pizer said Rebel told her it was time. So, Pizer put on her mask, walked to the front door, rang the doorbell twice. And Fabiano opened the door. A Pizer said she was trembling so hard she could barely hold the gun. She had to grab her hand with her other hand in order to control the shaking. And she was only able to pull the trigger one time, hitting Peter in the middle of the chest. A Pizer rushed back to the car, where Rebel thanked her for taking care of Peter and then drove away. They dropped the car back at Barrett's home in Hollywood, leaving the jacket inside. Rebel told Pizer to forget they knew each other. They each went their separate ways on foot. A Pizer burned the rest of the costume the following night and stowed the gun in the locker, where it stayed until police found it a month later. One of the two bullets was still in the chamber. 
Uh, charged with first-degree murder, Rebell pleaded not guilty, and Pizer pled insanity. March 11, 1958, just before their trials were to start, they made a plea bargain for second-degree murder. The deal sparked public outcry, viewed as being too soft on a killer's. But Pizer was so pathetic that it seemed unlikely a jury would send her to the gas chamber, even though she confessed to killing a total stranger in cold blood. If Pizer were to get off with a lesser conviction, the DA didn't think they would be able to get rebel on conspiracy charges. The following month, Pizer and Rebell were sentenced to life in prison. Life in prison is actually eight years. The folks in charge think that once a person has been incarcerated for this time period, they're not likely to ever kill again. They have been proven wrong on numerous occasions. I used to work with a guy who had served two life sentences for two different murders eight years each. I wonder who called the police about the rented locker. Someone must have known Pizer having shot Fabiano. I doubt it was Rebel. She had no reason to bring scrutiny in their direction. Pizer would have been too self-conscious to come up with the idea on her own. Someone called in the report of a vital piece of evidence being secreted away in the department store. I really wonder who it was. Freedom, Pennsylvania. Police say a nine-year-old girl dressed up in a Halloween party was accidentally shot by a relative with a shotgun who mistook her for a skunk. New Swickley Township police say the girl was wearing a black costume, a black hat with white tassels. A Chief Ronald Leindecker told the Beaver County Times that a male relative fired his shotgun at the girl, hitting her in the shoulder, arm, back, and neck. Leindecker told the newspaper that the girl was alert and talking when she was flown to Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, about 30 miles away. Her condition was unavailable at the time of the report. Leindecker says the man hadn't been drinking, and he doesn't know whether charges will be filed. As seeing what looked like a giant skunk had caused the relative to fire into the dark. Now that is never a good idea. New Swickley police said that a decision would be made later on whether to charge the relative with assault or something worse. I wonder what the Thanksgiving dinner was like that year. All the family gathered around the table, the the male relative looking at the young girl he just shot a while ago. Right, anyway, I'll bet it was kind of tense. They might not have even invited the guy. You, you stay away. You can have Thanksgiving dinner on your own. When John Song who went by Cindy Song, was born and raised in South Korea. When she was 15, she moved to the States to live with her aunt and uncle in Springfield, Virginia. After graduating high school, she went on to attend Pennsylvania State University. In 2001, Cindy was 21. She was a senior at Penn State majoring in art, and she was set to graduate in a few months. As she was living in an off-campus apartment in State College and working two part-time restaurant jobs. Halloween night, 2001, Cindy Song attended a costume party at Players Nightclub. As she was there with two friends, Stacy Pack and Lisa Kim. As Cindy was dressed up as a bunny. She had on bunny ears, a pink t-shirt with a bunny logo on it, a white tennis skirt with a tail attached, a brown suede knee-high boots, and a red hooded parka. Her friend said she looked cute. That's what she was trying for. She didn't look like a sexy bunny, 
She just looked like someone dressed up like a rabbit. The three partied into the early hours of November 1st. After the club closed at 2, they drove through downtown and stopped at a friend's apartment. There, they played video games for the next couple hours. At 4, Cindy was dropped off at her apartment by Stacy. Cindy's roommate, who had just got back from visiting her family in Philadelphia, returned home later that day. The apartment door was locked and nothing looked out of the ordinary, but Cindy wasn't there. Her friends began to become more and more concerned about not hearing from her. They reported her missing on November 4th, which was three days after anyone had contact with her. Two days later, the investigators searched the apartment. It's believed that she did enter her apartment, but left shortly after. Since she locked the door after herself, it seemed she had left voluntarily. The fake eyelashes that she had been wearing that night were on the bathroom counter, and her backpack and phone were in the apartment. The only thing that seemed to be missing was her purse which contained her driver's license, keys, and credit cards. Down the road from her apartment was a 24-hour convenience store that she would often walk to. And she was known to do so at odd hours. Maybe she'd made a trip there, thinking she would go right home. When investigators got her phone records, they learned there were no calls made or received after she was dropped off that night. None of her emails seemed alarming either. There was also no activity on any of her credit cards. After reading her diary, investigators began to believe drugs may have been involved. In it, she had talked about experimenting with ecstasy and marijuana. Her friends came to her defense and said that those were just normal college experiences. I can see why I never went to college. Investigators also took a look into Cindy's mental state. A month prior to her disappearance, she went through a rough breakup with her boyfriend. Her family thought maybe she took her own life, or maybe she ran off because of her broken heart. But her friends disagreed once more. They said Cindy had started therapy and was taking medication to help her mentally. Her friends stressed that Cindy was not the type of person to take off without letting someone know where she was. The only sighting of Cindy was a few days after she was reported missing, and it was over 200 miles in Chinatown. A woman called in a tip that a woman matching Cindy's description was in a vehicle that was parked on the sidewalk, near the sidewalk. The woman appeared to be crying and asking for help. She said a man suddenly appeared and told her to get lost. Police were skeptical of the sighting since the witness ended up changing her story several times. Anytime there's a disappearance, folks will come forward with sightings from all over the place. Mostly, these tie up the police looking into crazy stories and some not too crazy. In the long run, these sightings hardly ever pan out. In June 2003, a man named Paul Weekly was facing felony burglary charges, and he decided to talk to the police. Uh, Paul, who was a career criminal and awaiting several trials, told the police that Hugo Selensky and Michael Kurkowski had abducted a woman who they thought might be a prostitute. They'd spotted her in State College while she was walking along the street. He said they then took her to Hugo's house in Hunlock Creek, where they kept her in a walk-in safe. Once the men had had enough, the mystery woman was left to die. The woman described matched Cindy's description. 
Michael had been a wanted fugitive since May of 2002 after he was convicted of several felonies for running an illegal drug ring out of his pharmacy. He went missing with his girlfriend, Tammy Fassett, while awaiting sentencing. But Paul claimed that Hugo actually had killed Michael. Supposedly, Michael had kept Cindy's bunny ears as a trophy, and Hugo didn't like that. Paul told investigators that Hugo was actually responsible for the death of at least 16 people. He then led investigators to Solinsky's property, where five bodies were located. Two more bodies were found buried on property belonging to Michael and Tammy. Bone fragments belonging to drug dealers Frank James and Ida Keller were found in a burn pit, along with a third person who was never identified. After digging around on the property, a total of 12 bodies were discovered. None of the remains could be connected to Cindy. Since Michael was dead, there was no way to question him about the young woman's disappearance. Investigators did find that their chief witness, Paul, had been looking into the missing girl's story on his computer. This led them to believe he might be fabricating his story to avoid the death penalty in a murder case he was soon to be tried for. When one murderer testifies against another murderer, the testimony is questionable at best. Paul and Hugo are both serving life sentences for unrelated murders. The sighting in Philadelphia is hard to prove. Anyone close to Cindy at the time of her disappearance has been ruled out as a suspect. None of her friends believe she could have taken her own life and that she, or that she ran away. So what happened to Cindy? There's no body, no physical evidence, no witnesses, and no suspects. She basically vanished into thin air. This happens on several occasions. A young man or woman goes missing from a college. The authorities look into as many suspects as they can, only to come up with no clue as to where the missing person has gotten to. Perhaps we'll never find out what happened to Cindy Song. This next story comes from Frederica, Delaware. In 2005, the apparent suicide of a woman found hanging from a tree went unreported for several hours because passerbys thought it was a Halloween decoration. The Delaware State Police said a 42-year-old Frederica woman apparently climbed up a tree with a length of rope, hanged herself from a branch at about 9 p.m. The body, suspended about 15 feet above the ground, was easily visible from passing vehicles for several hours the next morning. According to State Police Spokesman Corporal Jeff Oldham, the residents who lived nearby said people noticed the body at about 7.30 the next morning, but they dismissed it as a Halloween prank. Authorities were called to the scene shortly before 11 when somebody finally realized that body was real. Oldham said the death of the woman who lived about a quarter mile from where her body was found, was being investigated as a suicide. A teenager who pretended to hang himself from a gallows as part of a, part of a Halloween hayride died while performing the stunt over the weekend. Hayride customers found the body of Brian Jewell, 17, at about 8 p.m. hanging from the gallows. His feet were barely touching the ground. The stunt had worked other nights, and there was no indication of foul play. The gallows were being checked for flaws, and an autopsy was performed. The way it's supposed to work is, he's supposed to have the noose around his neck, but it's not really a noose that tightens, said Hulpfeld. Jewel would step down about one foot to the ground, making it appear as if he had hanged. 
Uh, during the ride, about 40 people were sitting in the hay-filled wagon drawn by a tractor, which would take them past a number of Halloween fright exhibits. The stent stunt went off without problems early Saturday, but the tractor driver became concerned later that evening when Jewel failed to give the speech he normally did as the wagon passed. The hayride, which had been conducted every night that month, was suspended after the death of Jewel, who was a junior at Tom's River High School in southern New Jersey. Accidents happen, sometimes. People find out their best laid plans didn't work out the way they're supposed to. Never assume a stunt is going to work out unless you've checked it several times. A friend of mine from long ago, a master chief, I'm not going to give his last name, rigged up a rope and a repelling harness in front of his house. He then placed a fake noose around his neck and hung there, looking like a very elaborate Halloween decoration. When kids would walk up to the front of his house, he would move and make noises. This led to a lot of screaming, screaming and crying and kids running for their lives. He was given a severe talking to by his wife and the community leaders. Seeing as he was a corpsman in the Navy, I understand where he was coming from. What we think is funny, others think is very, very wrong. I get in trouble for my sense of humor all the time. Someone was hanging out at the rest area late on Halloween night wearing a hockey mask and brandishing a machete. A green field jacket uh, topped off the disguise. My supervisor told me to knock it off even though he had no evidence it was me. He just knew me real well. Don't forget, grab some coffee at the Organic Man Coffee Trike at 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you need glasses, Optica del Norte is the place you need to be. 107 Kyle del Norte. Get your eyes fixed so you know what the heck it is you're looking at. If your skin looks like you've been cleaning it with a Brillo pad, Maybe you should do something besides just scrubbing it. Contact Lourdes James at 956-723-3019 for some free skin care consultation. And if you hear a bump in the night, contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society. You can get a hold of them at laredoparanormal at hotmail.com. Get a free consultation. They'll come with all those cool gadgets you see on TV. Ronald Clark O'Brien is today remembered as the man who killed Halloween. He earned the nickname as well as another, the Candy Man, by murdering his own son, Timothy, eight years old, with a cyanide-laced treat. Although the Halloween stretches back to antiquity, Children in costume going door to door and asking for sweets is relatively recent, only about a century old. The tradition was firmly established by the 50s. Along with trick-or-treating rose another phenomenon, panic about people slipping poison, razor blades, pins, and other instruments of destruction into the goodies. Most of these horror stories have been relegated to urban myth. O'Brien is the one documented case that is cited when talk turns to killer Halloween candy. Really, if you think about it, try shoving a double-edged razor blade into an apple. First of all, you'll wind up cutting your own fingers. Second of all, the apple will be so badly damaged that nobody's going to want to touch it. It's going to have a great big slice in it. There's going to be sticky stuff oozing out of it. It just, it can't be done. Unless you take in the Hollywood special effects man. A lot of the urban myths just don't pan out. However, O'Brien, well, that was a real case. At 30 years of age, him and his wife 
Dineen, and two children, Timothy and Elizabeth, started Halloween evening with a meal at a friend's home, Jim Bates. He and his wife and children, all living in Pasadena, Texas, which is just up the road from my hometown. After dinner, the two dads left the house, escorting three children, Bates's son and O'Brien's son and daughter, out into the night for the annual candy hunt. One house along the route was dark, but the children still rang the bell. There was no answer, so they moved on. O'Brien lagged behind, and then moments later he came running up to catch up with the gang. He was waving five giant pixie sticks, 22-inch straws filled with flavored sugar. He told the kids it was their lucky day because a rich neighbor was distributing expensive treats. Each of the three children on the walk got one pixie stick. Later, O'Brien gave the fourth to Bates's other child, a five-year-old daughter. The final pixie stick went to a trick-or-treater who just showed up and rang the doorbell at the Bates's home. O'Brien said he got the treats from that dark house where the kids had rung the bell and nobody answered. Back at their home in Deer Park, O'Brien told his children they could each have a treat before bedtime. Timothy chose the pixie stick, but he stopped after the first taste, saying it was very bitter. Timothy's dad offered him Kool-Aid to wash it down. Moments later, O'Brien heard the boy crying. It wasn't long before he was up and complaining. His stomach hurt and he didn't feel good. He was soon bent over, vomiting. The boy was rushed to the hospital where the nurses and doctors tried to save his life, but their efforts were not enough. An autopsy found enough cyanide in the boy's body to kill three grown men. Examination of the pixie stick showed that someone had opened the tube, replaced some of the candy with poison, and then the tube had been stapled shut. One of the children who'd gotten the tainted pixie stick had been tempted, but fell asleep before he had pulled out the staple. The other tubes were recovered before any children tried to eat the contents. Police became suspicious of O'Brien's story, especially after he offered his version of how he came into possession of the deadly treats. He said that he rang the doorbell at the dark house, and a man had thrust five pixie sticks at him. He said he saw nothing but a hairy arm. It turns out that the man who lived there at the dark house was an air traffic controller, and he had about 200 witnesses who verified that he had been at work at the time that the treats were handed out. Detectives delved into O'Brien's background, came up with some startling facts. O'Brien, an optician who worked at Texas State Optical, was about $100,000 in debt. He had lost his house, and he was on the verge of losing his car as well. He was also about to lose his job because his bosses had discovered he was stealing. In the decade before the crime, O'Brien had been fired from 21 other positions. To top it all off, investigators learned that he'd taken out a $60,000 life insurance policy on each of his children. Police suspected that O'Brien had planned to kill his kids for the insurance money. Within days, O'Brien was under arrest for the murder of his son. Detectives were never able to pin down the source of the cyanide, but several witnesses at O'Brien's trial told of his interest in obtaining the poison, and he wanted to know how much would it take to kill a person. 
His sister-in-law also said that at the boy's funeral, the grieving dad had mused about using the insurance money to take a long vacation. The only inescapable conclusion is that this man killed his own flesh and blood for money, Prosecutor Mike Hinton told the court. Think how easy it would be for him to kill a total stranger for money. The jury took 46 minutes to find O'Brien guilty and worthy of the death penalty. Appeals drug on for the next 10 years, and O'Brien maintained he was innocent right up until the final days. March 34, 1984, the Candy Man had his last supper, steak, french fries, peas, and Boston cream pie, before his execution by lethal injection. As the sentence was being carried out, demonstrators in Halloween masks stood outside the prison, yelling trick-or-treat. Here's a weird item for you to think about. The most asked-for side dish in a last meal is french fries. The main course has been known to be fried chicken. Every year, the authorities offer candy exams to be sure no one is handing out poison. When I was young, it was LSD-laced candy being handed out by the hippies. No one ever found any LSD in any candy on November 1st. The kids that were being poisoned on Halloween were almost all at the hands of their own parents. So, you don't have to worry about suspicion about suspicious strangers handing out, handing out poison candy. It's those you know you have to keep an eye on. The family of a man who died suddenly on his front porch in Denver are lashing out at the neighborhood mailman who they say ignored the corpse because he claimed he thought it was a Halloween display. Dale Porch, 46, was coming back from working the overnight shift at Regional Transportation District in Denver on November 2nd when he collapsed on the porch steps. He died where he fell. That day, the mail handler arrived and he saw the body laying on the steps and thought it was just an elaborate Halloween display that the folks hadn't bothered to remove yet. The family might have seen a paycheck in their future when on the 9th they began accusing the mail handler of not contacting authorities or getting help for their dead relative. By the time the mail arrived, the guy would have been well beyond any help. The people will try to sue someone, especially when a government entity is involved. During the trial, the citizens who are on the jury will think, well, the government has so much money, what will it hurt to give some to this poor grieving family? Not thinking that the money is coming from us taxpayers. In the long run, the jury will drive their own taxes up by making these decisions. In San Antonio, Texas, a man dressed as Freddy Krueger arrived at a Halloween party uninvited. He and several other men simply walked in and tried to join the festivities. The homeowner spotted the men and asked them to leave. This led to yelling and pushing match. One of the suspects, a man dressed as Freddy Krueger, pulled out a concealed shotgun and began to shoot at the partygoers. Neighbors heard the shots being fired and called the police. In all, they say they heard five or six shots. Outside was pandemonium as the party guests ran for their lives. Some drove away, while others simply ran down the sidewalk. When the police arrived, they found four men and one woman with gunshot wounds. The suspects had all fled the scene. Uh-oh. Okay, Dave, this is for you. Go ahead, you're on the air. Ah, it's an important message from my Google listing that I don't have. I've tried contacting Google on many occasions. 
telling them that I don't have a business. Yet, every day I'll receive five or six calls from my Google listing that I don't have, uh, saying that I need to do something with it. Every day, five, six calls. And when I try to contact Google, well, they're not interested in talking to me. They've hung up on me every time I called. Our number is listed on the do not call list, but that doesn't seem to work either. Okay, back to the shooting in San Antonio. The female that had been shot tried to drive herself to the hospital, but she crashed her car. And she was transported to the university hospital. One of the male victims went to downtown Baptist Hospital, and the other three males were transported to university hospital. With everybody dressed up for Halloween, nobody could say what the shooter looked like. He looked like Freddy Krueger, but being an uninvited party crasher, nobody could say who he actually was. The men were all dressed up and nobody knew them. I would guess that one of the uninvited had second thoughts about being involved in a shooting where people could have died. This is not the kind of thing that sits well on some people's conscience. It's one thing to barge into a party uninvited. It's another to shoot the partygoers. A 22-year-old man was arrested in connection with the mass shooting in 2016 Halloween party on the west side. Robert Contreras was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Contreras, who was dressed as Freddy Krueger and a group of several other men, arrived at the party at 2900 block of Aspen Meadow at about 5 in the morning. The 25-year-old host of the party didn't recognize the men, so he refused to let them in. Three of the men, including Contreras, pushed their way inside, initiating a shoving match. And during the fight, one of the uninvited guests yelled at the host that he should stand there and fight his brother one-on-one. -on -one. They did fight, but the host saw Contreras, still dressed as Freddy Krueger, was now holding a shotgun. Contreras fired, striking not only the host, but four other people as well. He and several other uninvited guests then fled the scene. There were no breaks in the case until the host reportedly identified Contreras in a photo lineup. The affidavit didn't specify how the police developed Contreras as a suspect. A second witness identified him as well, police said. A judge signed a warrant for Contreras' arrest, and he was finally taken into custody for the shooting. Contreras was only charged in connection to shooting the host, but he could face further charges as time went by. I'm glad they caught the shooter, but the case sounds a bit shaky to me. How was the host able to pick Contreras out of a lineup if he never saw the man's face? One of the accomplices must have been involved, but he didn't want his name mentioned. You don't want your friends to know that you're the guy that dropped the dime on them. In Los Angeles, a man dressed as a horror movie villain Freddy Krueger, all the way down to the knives on his gloved fingers, was arrested for stabbing a man on Halloween Boulevard. Police said the stabbing occurred at 7 p.m. just down the street from the fabled Grauman's Chinese Theater, where the Hollywood stars have left their footprints in cement for decades. A Joseph Zachary, 25, was booked for investigation of assault with a deadly weapon, according to Los Angeles Police Department. Police said the stabbing occurred after Zachary got into an altercation with a 37-year-old Hollywood man whose name was not being released. It turned out those knives on his gloves were real. Nobody noticed they were weapons until he began using them. Uh, people in the area often dress as characters from movies, and officers said they arrived 
<coughs> excuse me, they arrived to find Zachary decked out as the villain from Nightmare on Elm Street. Police said he was wearing a hat, wig, sweater, and had brown leather glove on his right hand that had six-inch knives attached to four of the fingers. Well, just like the guy in the movie. A Fort Dodge in Webster County, Iowa. Marvin Brandland, 69, and his wife Ethel had spent the evening of October 31st handing out candy to trick-or-treaters. This was in 1982. There was a knock at the door and the couple went to hand out treats. Someone wearing a pillowcase with holes cut out for eyes stood outside. This sounds like the character The Phantom from the movie The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Now there's an old movie for you. Uh, based on a true story that happened up in Texarkana. The costume person said, trick or treat, give me your money or I'll shoot. Ethel thought this person might be one of her relatives playing a bizarre trick, so she tried to pull the case off the man's head. The man grabbed the corner of his mask and held it in place. <coughs> Still thinking this was just a trick-or-treater, Ethel reached for the bowl of candy. As she turned, the hooded man entered their home. He pulled a gun and ordered the couple to head for the basement. Marvin Brandlin was a World War II Army veteran who owned a carpet service business. He was not a wealthy man, though he and his wife did have a safe in the basement. The safe was not known about by many people outside the immediate family, and it didn't contain much money. When they got to the kitchen, Mr. Brandland refused to go along further with what he felt was a prank, so he reached for the gun. The hooded man fired one shot, hitting Marvin in the neck. The shooter pulled the pillowcase from his head and ran from the home. Ethel called the police and then had to wait for the ambulance to arrive. Marvin was taken to the hospital and then flown to Des Moines, where he died on the operating table. The police began looking at family members, since the safe was not a well-known item to the public. Once the family had been cleared, they turned to people who might have known the couple. The pillowcase was the only evidence the authorities had. They submitted it for DNA analysis, but nothing substantial came back. Following her husband's murder, Ethel Brandlin broke down on Thanksgiving Day and died a few months later. Family members say she died of a broken heart. What makes this case especially disturbing is that the family is certain they know who the shooter was. There's an acquaintance of the family. They say he bragged about the shooting. The police did have a suspect, but they lacked enough evidence to arrest or prosecute anyone. Lacking in any leads, the case was put on hold, and it's still on hold today. The family said they plan to keep pushing for an arrest, even though they're afraid the killer may come after them. With advances in science, the police hoped that eventually the DNA would come back with enough for an arrest, but they're still waiting. Murder has no statute of limitations, so if any evidence ever comes to light, someone is going to be arrested. <coughs> As October marched on, I watch all the scary shows on TV. I get a kick out of these supposed ghost investigators that go looking for spirits and then scream and run away as soon as anything happens. I say they're acting like little girl, but then I realize they're not acting like a little girl I know, at least not the one I met at Fort McIntosh. The LPRS was conducting ghost investigations as well as guest events each Friday and Saturday night in October of 2018, at Fort McIntosh, which is now the Laredo College. The event was open to students and staff as well as their family. 11-year-old Sophie, accompanied by her mother, 
showed up every night to attend the investigations. She even brought her own equipment. Her mom told me her daughter asked for ghost hunting equipment for her birthday as well as for Christmas. The second night we were at the old guardhouse. This was the military version of a jail. The building was from 1886. The rooms are a bit small, and so the guests all crowded into one room, and I stood out on the porch, looking in through the door. The students were armed with cameras, recorders, EMF detectors. Sophie was the first one through the door to look for ghosts. The others followed into the dark room. Someone kicked something over in the dark. This was followed by a scream. All the students came running from the guardhouse. They cleared the porch and kept running to the parking lot. I looked into the room to see if anyone was out. There was Sophie, holding an EMF in one hand and a digital thermometer in the other, looking for spirits. I asked her mom if this was normal, and she said yes. Her kid was really into ghosts. So, next time you get scared by something that goes bump in the night, try acting like a little girl, and don't panic. Hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. Like I said earlier, as far as I know, these are all true stories. It's just something to make Halloween not quite so enjoyable. When you sit there and wonder about that bag of candy or that relative at home waiting for you. If you enjoyed tonight's show, let your friends know what they're missing. If you have any subjects you'd like to hear about, give me a, a note in the mail. You can contact me at strangethings at arcanasa.com. Till next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree where they strung up a man the same murder three? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree.